Chelsea, I'm barely here. Well, we are so glad that you're here in the room. Welcome to you in the room. Welcome to you joining us online and in a gateway gathering and welcome to our prison campuses. We are so glad that you're here. Would you stand to your feet as we worship this morning?
filled with over 3,000 students declaring just that at our student conference. So powerful, so powerful that the next generation is crying out to God, saying, God, you're all we want. God, you're all we need. A generation that is desiring and longing for more of who God is and can't get enough of him. And I know that the same presence and power of God that was here the past couple of days that brought freedom of anxiety, depression, lost hope from fear and shame. It's here right now in this room and it's here and it's ready to move. This next generation is ready to conquer this world. Walking outside of these doors that they are ready to say, I am unashamed to say who I am in Christ. And I know that Christ lives in me and I will live my life to worship him with all that I am. And I even see some students in this room that I watched worship over the past couple of days, and I can't help but get emotional and knowing who they are and watching them live for the Lord. This generation is amazing. They are powerful, they are confident, and they walk in authority. So I wanna encourage us and empower us that the same God that has been going and been working through generations and generations. He's gonna work through this next generation. And he's gonna continue to work through every single generation that is to come. The same God that we worship today, that is realigning purposes for our students, that there is a reason to live. There is a reason to live, and it's to worship and to glorify the one true God. So Lord, we worship you today, only you today, Jesus. God, there's no one like you. There's no one like you, God. God, may we worship with the same zeal and passion that over 3,000 students in this very same room worshiped you with. And to worship you, I live to
that song, I just had this sense that some of you came in not feeling so firm, not feeling so stable, because the spirit of fear is a false prophet. And it comes to you and it says, hey, watch out for your finances. Hey, watch out for the gas prices. Hey, watch out for the news. Hey, watch out for the elections. Hey, watch out for this, watch out for that. And everything comes a little shaky, a little unstable. And there are moments where we have to sing songs like this and we have to remind our soul that Christ is our firm foundation and our house will be built on the rock that is Jesus Christ. So if that's you today, I wanna invite you right now to put your hand on your heart. Put your hand on your heart. And as I pray, I want you to remind your soul that in those places that feel unstable, remind your soul that Christ is your firm foundation. So God, we worship you right now. And in those things that have been stealing our attention, they've been a distraction and they have told us that our foundation is anything but firm. We remind our soul right now that Jesus, our house is built on you. You are our firm foundation and we will not fear. We receive the spirit that you have given us. We receive the Holy Spirit that has given us power, love, and a sound mind. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen, amen. Can you give it up to the Lord one more time? Well, as Pastor Madison said, we just finished our student conference. We had almost 4,000 students filling this place, worshiping the Lord. And some of you that came through the lobby, you saw the CDs hanging from the wall. You're like, what in the world? Gateway's got new decor. Well, now you know, we had a student conference and that's how we roll, all right? We like to decorate with CDs. We're a little crazy like that. But we had an amazing, amazing time. And I'd love to show you in this recap video. And then I'm gonna invite Joel, one of our students, to come pray, to come bless his generation and bless us. So remain standing and check this out. I'm praying that somebody in this room will get revelation. Just let it rush. And you will make that call. Mom, dad, you're not gonna believe it. I just made an adjustment. The one you've been praying about for a while. God opened my eyes. I just get like this to feel alive. Jesus is giving you life and he's giving you life more abundantly. He's giving you enough for you and enough for the world that's around you. You are not your issue. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. You are his prized possession. You are his treasure, come on. Righteousness is not a feeling, it's just who you are. He speaks holiness, he speaks righteousness over you. And your life is the process of you catching up to what he spoke. We see his face and we hear his voice, then our faith can come alive so loud and so clear. Isn't that awesome? It was wild, it was so much fun. Well, I've got Joel here. He is one of our students. He is a junior. And so he is gonna pray. He's gonna pray for his generation. He's gonna pray for us. And I'm excited, Joel. Pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, in your word, it says that we not have received, we have not received a spirit of fear leading to slavery again. If we have received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So I pray for this next generation that we will be released from this fear. We will be released from slavery of this world and we will be released into the family of God. We were released from depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, whatever it may be that's causing us to be chained to this world and that we will be accepted into your family. I pray that in Colossians it says that we are renewed by the one who created him and that there's no distinction between Greek or Jew, barbarian, Scythian, 
circumcised or uncircumcised. So I pray that there will be no division, whether it be politics, ethnicity, race, old or young, but that we will all be one family under the house of God, because Christ is all and he is in all. And lastly, I pray that everything we say and do will glorify and honor you in your heavenly name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Joel. Well, take a minute, turn around, greet those around you. We've got a great message by Pastor Josh. a gathering, a campus, or online, we're so glad you're joining us. A lot of great things are happening at Gateway. Here are just a few. To stay connected with all that's going on, visit gatewaypeople.com, follow us on social media, and join your campus Facebook group. If you'd like to give today, you can do that through our website, our mobile app, or one of our offering envelopes at any of our campuses. There's so many opportunities to grow, connect, and be encouraged. To learn more, stop by Connect Central, text CONNECT to 71010, or visit gatewaypeople.com. We're so glad you joined us. Thanks for being here today. I used to be a youth pastor, which I know you know from the second you saw me. I have strong youth pastor energy to me. I know that. Like, I look like I'd be good at ping pong and a devotional, and I am. Heaven holds its breath, waiting in anticipation as an inner transformation becomes a public declaration. I once was lost, wounded, lonely, afraid. I was dead in my sin. Not a washing of the body, but a cleansing of the spirit, a resurrection of beauty from the ashes a celebration of faith. Now I'm found. Healed. Loved. Brave. Now I am alive in Christ. Made new. Made new. Made new. Made new. We need to see Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus, who even when we mess up and we don't get to the place where we want to be, He comes down Himself and He scoops us up and with such meticulous care. This is the grace of Jesus. It is consistent from the beginning to the end. His love for you is never exhausted. It never runs out and it never ends. All right, welcome to Gateway Church. Thanks so much for being here. We are excited that you're here and that you're worshiping with us. I want to welcome all the campuses, the prison campuses, the campuses around the DFW area, and even outside of that, and gatherings that are all over the place. So welcome so much. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I want to let you know that next weekend is water baptism. So if you have, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you've never been water baptized, You can do that next weekend. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you can do that and then just get water baptized right after that next weekend or this weekend. We're always here for that, all right? So uh, water baptism happens next weekend. We'd love for you to 
join us for that. It'll be great. I'll give you a quick update on Christy, who works with us that I told you about last week. She was in a, a pretty difficult car accident, broke her pelvis and her sacrum. She is doing well. And praise God, she got a report that no surgery will be needed. Everything is in line. So she's doing good, um, trying to get up every once in a while and take some steps, but she's doing really good and recovering well. So we have been in a series called Jesus BC, and uh, that might not make sense at first, Jesus before Christ. Uh, But what we're talking about is the appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. And today, the title of the message is The King, and we'll be talking about who the king is in this realm and in this kingdom. Uh, And uh, so we've been talking about these appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. And we started talking about Jesus' name, and it's Yeshua. It's really close to Yehoshua, which is Joshua. My name is Joshua. Um... And I told you about this little fear that I had, uh, which is that I would have like an expiration date because I started thinking about it. I couldn't find any old Joshes. I've never heard anybody be like, hey, Grandpa Josh. It's just never happened, all right? And so I got pretty worried. I was like, well, you know, there's no old Joshes. How long am I going to last here? Like, what's going on? I was trying to figure it out. And I let you guys know about my, my fear, and you responded in resounding emails and messages telling me that you had found an old Josh, that it was Josh McDowell. Last week, you even made me say his age. I didn't want to do that, guys. You just, you forced me into it, and I had to admit defeat last week. I said, okay, you're right. You all found an old Josh, but I felt like you kind of proved my point because you could only find one old Josh. That was, I only got one. It was Josh McDowell, and I got it from everybody. And then the plot thickens because there was an eagle-eyed gateway member who started looking a little bit closer. And I'd like to show you, this is the Wikipedia page for Josh McDowell. But can you zoom in here on his name? Oh, it's not Josh. It's not Josh at all. I gotcha. I got all of you. There's no old Joshes. Nope. You can't find one. That's not even his name. Oh, does it feel good to be a winner? Yes, it does. <laughs> Woo, it does. This is the moment I've been waiting for. Wow, it feels good. Maybe I'll just stand here and take it in for just a moment. <laughs> the challenge continues. Find me an old Josh, all right? You can't do it. You know, uh, that means that Josh McDowell has got to be the only person in all of the history of the world that ever changed their name to Josh. I only hear people changing their name away from Josh, you know? I got a friend named Noah, and uh, he had a, a similar experience to me. His name was actually Josh. That's his given name from his parents. And all through school, there was a million Joshes. And so when he got to college and they called Roland, said, tell us if you want to be called something different. She had already called probably a dozen Joshes in his class. And so uh, they, got, they got to him and he just decided like, what's a name no one has? I'll be Noah. So he just, he's Noah now. That's how we know him. Like that, he's just Noah. He, he's, that's what I'm used to is people changing their name away from Josh and not to Josh. So challenge continues. Find me an old Josh and I will admit defeat yet again, like I did last week, uh, so humbly as I did. And, uh, <laughs> but that humility has gone now. I won. All right. Um, <laughs> All right, so we're talking about Jesus in the Old Testament, and we're looking at all of these instances where Jesus shows up in human form. The Bible says that we cannot see God the Father, that we can only see him through the unique one, through Jesus. Jesus is the one who, when we see him, he takes a glorified form as well. But when we see Jesus show up in human form, this is Jesus. And actually, there's very, very few instances where we actually see God the Father in the Old Testament. And in reality, we don't even see him. These are visions that were given. And so the glory of the Father did not consume the person. But even in visions, it was dicey, okay? And so uh, let me show you one of those visions where we see Jesus and God the Father at the same time. This is in Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 13. It says, In my vision at night I looked, and therefore before me was one like a son of man. Who's that? That's Jesus. Coming with the clouds of heaven. 
He approached who? The ancient of days and was led into his presence. So we see both of those characters here, Jesus the Son and uh, God the Father, the ancient of days. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this is an instance where we see Jesus and God the Father at the same time. God the Father is called the Ancient of Days here, but all authority is given to the Son in this passage, the authority over the the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. And this is important because it is where we see the transfer of authority to Jesus, and that is how we know that he is the king. The Bible refers to him over and over and over again as the king. I can only find two places where I think the Bible may have been referring to God the Father as the king. That doesn't mean that he's not the king. It means that what his, what his reigning and ruling is is even above that, almost, it, almost like the, an emperor. And then what you really have is then Jesus being the king over a territory or a certain section of, of, the, of the cosmos, of the universe. And so Jesus is the king. This illustrates that transfer of authority that took place. Revelation 5 is another place where we see Jesus and the Father together. And, uh, and that is a, a, another reason why we cannot believe in a Jesus-only theology. Jesus comes from the Father. The Bible says he comes from the bosom of the Father. He comes from the Father and, and, and originates from him. And so uh, a Jesus-only theology doesn't make sense because we see all of these instances where the Father is there. Now, some, some Jewish people might reject that Jesus really was the Messiah, and one of the reasons that they may have an, object, an objection to that is because it, it seems as though when Jesus came to the earth, in general, certainly there were exceptions to this, but in general, the Jewish people did not accept him as the Messiah, but a lot of Gentiles did accept him as the Messiah. So I just want to take a brief moment and let's answer that question because the fact that, that he was not necessarily accepted by his family, the Jewish people, is actually a fulfillment of the prophecy that says that he is the Messiah and not an indication that he is not the Messiah. Psalm 118 verse 22 says, the stone the builders rejected has become the corner stone. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3, it says explicitly here, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom the people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. So Jesus is being not accepted necessarily by all Jewish people. It's not an indication that he was not the Messiah. One of the best pictures in the Old Testament of Jesus as the Messiah is actually the story of Joseph. And uh, Pastor Robert, my dad, he'll be starting a series um, in two weeks, and it will be on the topic of Joseph. If you watch and pay attention to the story of Joseph, it is the, it is the telling of the story of Christ. And even this element of Jesus being rejected by the ones who should accept him the most is also foretold even in the story of Joseph, because you'll remember that he is rejected even by his own brothers, his family, but becomes ruler over Egypt. And so here, uh, this Egypt would then represent the Gentiles. He becomes a ruler over them, but is rejected by his own family. All right, so as we talk about Jesus the King, we, we, we often focus very much on Jesus the suffering servant, the one who came humbly offering grace and died for our sins. There's obviously nothing wrong with that. But as we're seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, and then reconciling Jesus of the New Testament, you might start having some questions. Those questions might pertain to the idea that, well, in the Old Testament, God seems very harsh, judgmental, law-giving, uh, very, very much lacking grace. And then Jesus comes in the New Testament and he's full of grace and he's full of, of love and compassion. And so what kind of disparity exists here? So what I want to talk to you today about is Jesus, the king, but he is not just the king, he is the warrior king. 
Jesus, in, 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 in his kingship and authority, has all authority to make whatever decisions he wants to make. And, and you could think of it as uh, a, a, a mother trying to protect her children or a mother bear trying to protect her cubs. You could think of it as uh, the father who hears the sound as someone's breaking into their home and he wakes up saying, I will do whatever it takes to protect my family. This is the style of king that Jesus is, one who is watching out for us, one who is a warrior and, and, and is ready to go to battle to protect us in every way. So we're going to look at a couple different instances where Jesus is this warrior king. We start in Joshua chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 13. This is the story of, of Joshua, and Jesus shows up to him here. It says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man, that's our first indication that this is Jesus, standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? He replied, neither. Some, some translations just say no. He was like, no, not a valid question. But as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Does this ring any bells? Remember last week, the same thing. Jesus in the midst of the burning bush said the exact same thing to Moses. Take off your sandals because you are standing in holy ground. This is Jesus that is speaking. He is consistent just as he was at the burning bush to this moment now. He is God. He is worshiped as God by Joshua, and he speaks as God. This is God in the form of man. He shows up. He's got his sword drawn, meaning he's ready for battle. He's looking buff. He's all like, he's all cut. He's ready to go. He's ready to do some battle. And Joshua sees this man, and he's a warrior. And so he says, he's, he's, this, is a, this is a soldier, this is a warrior, whose side are you on? And Jesus says, neither, neither. Here Jesus is expressing, I am not going to be on your side or their side because I don't follow you, you follow me. Jesus, as the warrior, steps in and goes into this fight. He is not simply a man or an angel. He is God. Joshua even acknowledges him as God. And I believe that Joshua was familiar with his voice. For instance, he sees this soldier walking up to him. He says, whose side are you on? And he says, neither. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Okay, Theoretically, that could have been an angel or anybody else, but I believe because of Joshua's proximity to Moses. The Bible even says that when Moses would leave the tent of meeting, Joshua would stick around. So I believe that he had heard the voice of Jesus before, and as soon as he says, neither, I am the commander of the Lord's army, that's how Joshua knows immediately to fall to the ground face first, and to worship this man as God, because he knows that this is God. So Jesus then guides Joshua through these difficult times. And what's really important about this encounter, can't be overstated, is that this is Yeshua, Jesus, and Yehoshua, Joshua. It's a derivative of the exact same name, Yeshua and Joshua meeting face to face. If you don't know this, Joshua is also a type of Christ. Joshua's life is a foretelling or a prophecy of the Jesus to come. So here, Joshua and Jesus are meeting face to face. What this is, is a meeting face to face where you have Joshua, who is currently fulfilling the role of prophesying the future role of Jesus. And Jesus, who will one day testify to all the things that happened to Joshua by becoming the fulfillment of the prophecy. And here they are meeting face to face. The power that is in this moment is incredible. Jesus is the commander of the Lord's army. Now, who is the Lord's army? The Lord's army is the angels, the ones who haven't fallen, and they are in Jesus's army. And there's a spiritual war that's always taking place to win over the territory of this earth. I'll explain more about that in just a moment, but we say it's a spiritual realm. Really, it's a dimension that we 
can't see. We actually lost our ability to see that dimension in the fall. Before that, Adam and Eve had spiritual sight. The, 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 the definition or the, the explanation of the word of the sight when they see the tree of life is a spiritual sight. The next time we see that word used is when Moses has a spiritual sight of the burning bush. So what happens is that in the moment that Adam and Eve become aware that they are naked, it is not that they gained sight to notice that they were naked. It is that they lost sight and they could not see their glorified bodies anymore, only their shameful bodies. It's a loss of sight. That's what's taking place. And so in this realm, this realm exists all around us and there is a, there's a battle that is being waged, a war that is being waged. You have the Satan, the accuser, the fallen one who then took a third of the angels with him. They act as an enemy to God, constantly trying to thwart everything that he does and constantly trying to end the story of Christ in this world. And, and so this spiritual sight, we're not able to see it, but this war is waging all the time and these warriors that fight with Jesus are the angels who have remained in, in his realm. All right, so let's look now at who that army is. What do they look like? What do they sound like? What, who is this army? We see not the commander in this passage, but we see the army in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 15. It says, when the servant of the man of God, this is a story about Elisha, and this servant is a servant of Elisha. So it's talking about the man of God is Elisha. When this servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And he's thinking like, He's lost his mind right now. But Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, gave him that spiritual vision once again, and he looked and he saw the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is the war that is being waged in the spiritual realm. These are those fighters. These are those fighters that it is describing that are standing on chariots of fire with horses and they are up on the hills indicating, number one, that they have the high ground over the enemy and number two, that they descended from on high and rested on the hills to help fight that battle. So earlier then in Joshua 5, we see the commander of the army, but no army, all right? Then here in 2 Kings, we see the army, but not the commander of the army. So is there a place in the Bible where we get to see the commander of the army and the army together. Yes, it is at the end of the age. It's in the least confusing book in the Bible, Revelation, and I'll show that to you now. It's the, if you're like a brand new Christian, jump straight into Revelation, you'll understand all of it. Revelation 19, <laughs> chapter 11 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. If you don't already know, this is talking about Jesus, okay? With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and, his head, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword. Some of the, some of the translations do describe those chariots as having fire as well, just like we just read. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Revelation 19 puts together the commander of the Lord's army that we saw and the army that we saw, puts both of those together in the same form, carrying the sword in the same identity, confirming to us, if Revelation 19 is talking about Jesus, which it absolutely and clearly is talking about the second coming of Jesus, then we know also that this same character that we see in Joshua is Jesus himself. 
the commander of the Lord's army, standing there with Jesus. The commander is the same commander. The connection between Revelation 19 and Joshua 5 is extremely significant because it pulls all of these together and the unity between these two images of the divine army commander forms a profound connection between the worldview of the new covenant and the old, between the Christian worldview and the Jewish worldview. Asher and Trader says, when understood correctly, it is a bridge that provides a consistent theme from the beginning of the scriptures to the end. Side note, next week, I know I've been telling you a lot about this. Next week is gonna be um, one story all the way through. And I've only been able to give you a little piece of this and a little piece of that and a little piece of this in each of the messages. And next week, we're gonna pull it all together in one story. And it's, it's gonna bring a lot of these things that maybe are left unknown right now. It's gonna bring a lot of those things together. So we'll hear the whole consistent theme from the beginning to end. Now, Jesus is this warrior king. And when he returns, he will set things right. We saw the transfer of power that takes place in Daniel 7. Uh, And it's important to know then that Jesus is the king of this earth. He is the king of this realm. It was never taken from him. It never has been taken from him. And it never will be taken from him. Jesus is king. So if Jesus is king, what would our role be in that? What would our role be in serving this? Jesus creates everything with a specific purpose in mind. Our specific purpose was fellowship and communion with God, and it was also to have dominion over the earth. That's stated clearly in Genesis that God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the earth. So the king who has all authority and all dominion created the world himself, understands and knows all things, decided to partner with you and I so that he would give us dominion over the earth. We have that dominion over the earth. And, and contrary to what we, we often think, we never actually lost our dominion in the fall. Because if you just look a little bit later in the story of Noah, it confirms that man still has dominion over the earth. What actually happened in the fall is that we had dominion over the earth, which meant that we had authority. And when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, decided not to be uh, sustained by God, but instead to be sustained by their own knowledge, what they handed over was not the dominion of the earth, but the authority the authority of the earth was handed over to Satan in that moment. And we know that it was because when Jesus comes to earth, remember that Satan shows up to him in the wilderness and what does he offer him? The authority over the kingdoms and rulers of the world. Satan owned that at that time. We have handed over the authority that Jesus gave to us. He is still king. We still have dominion. We have complete control. We do not have to listen to the voice of the accuser, and we do not have to do what he says. (laughs) Dominion of the earth still belongs to us, and it is what we were designed for. Paul says that the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Our dominion over this earth cannot be revoked. But what can happen is that we can abdicate our authority to the accuser. So what we lost then in the fall of man is the authority over this earth, all right? And when we lost our authority, it was given to the beast, the Satan, and all of his fallen angels and the sons of God that had rebelled and taken over different territories. And as the authority was given over, even as the Bible talks about princes and principalities, those are areas where princes of darkness, fallen sons of God, have taken authority over certain areas of land, principalities. They have taken authority over those principalities of land. We're going to understand next week why it is that God worked in the way that he did to, to, to bring restoration. And it has a lot to do with the spiritual realm has very defined rules. Satan must abide even as a fallen angel. He must abide by the rules of the spiritual realm. And so this is a battle for the dominion of the earth. That's what he's trying to take from us. So we lost our authority. Jesus is coming. He will make things right in the world and he will commit a final judgment towards the accuser or towards the Satan. And what will happen then is that there will be a new heaven and a new 
earth. No longer will there be a barrier between our vision of the earthly realm and the spiritual realm. We'll continue to have dominion and authority over the earth, but the two realms will be perfectly brought together. together. Heaven and earth will exist together. So then how should we handle our dominion over the earth? All right, well, let's think back to the passage that we read a moment ago where Joshua asked Jesus, are you for us or against us? This is the question that we would only ask if we had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, we would say, Jesus, you tell me where to go. You tell me what to do, and I'll do that and only that. Jesus was the model of that. He said, I do and say only what the Father tells me to do and say. So we have this dominion, but yet at the same time, we in our fallen state try to always decide what is right and wrong. We've seen Christians, we've seen uh, culture wars that are happening all over the world. We see the degradation of values or morals, and we believe this is the fight that we need to fight because God is on our side. What I want to say to you today is not so fast. Even if you have the Bible that tells you everything that you need to know about this, you still, even if you know that you are in the right, you are still not supposed to go wage a war unless God has told you to do it. The only reason why Joshua wins that war is because when he sees the commander of the Lord's army, he says, you tell me what to do and that's what I'll do. I wonder if maybe we've been going out and trying to fight culture wars, thinking that this is really the battle. It's a distraction from the enemy. We are to be listening to the commander of the Lord's army, following our king and doing exactly as he says and only when he says it. So we must be fighting, but we will never get very far unless he's on our side. And it doesn't mean that we should fight this war, and then ask him if he's on our side. It means we should say, Lord, what battle would you have me fight today? We must be warriors just as Jesus was. I'm going to tell you about how that actually works in just a moment, but we must be able to fight the battles that God has called us to fight because our dominion over the earth is what is at stake. It does not mean that we will rule in whatever way that we want to. This is how we actually lost our dominion in the first place. It will be that we are warriors, but that we are only following the one true king. All right, so um, I've been trying to, I'm gonna do something weird. And I've been trying to think about how to do this. And so you just have to forgive me if, uh, um, if, it, uh, if I struggle with it a little bit. Uh, so you know the story of the prodigal son, uh, probably. And, and let me just, let me just uh, clear, like, restate it briefly for just a moment. You have a father. He lives in his house, and he has two sons. Those two sons are going to inherit his kingdom, his property, his, his money, finances, world, all of those things. These two sons are going to inherit it. One of the sons says, I'd like to go ahead and take my inheritance now. He takes his inheritance, he sells it all so that he can have the money, and he goes and lives in absolute lavish decadence until it runs out. And then he lives with pigs. Um, he literally eats the slop from the pig trough. He is, uh, is destitute. He's dying. He's, he's, he's in an awful place to be. And that's the story of the prodigal son. And he realizes in, in, in that, that that he needs grace. And he says, if I went back to my father's house, then even as a servant, I would be living better than I'm living now. And so he goes back and the father welcomes him. And, and, and instead of... Uh, Uh, some kind of critical judgment from the father. He hugs him, he kisses him, he brings him in. And and I I think it was Pastor Greg Stone that told me that in, in Jewish culture, especially at that time, part of the reason that the father goes running out to meet him in the street is for the son's protection because anyone in that community who would take their father's blessing and go and squander it in that way was deserving of death. So really the father's even actually protecting the son and then not only bringing him in and not punishing him, but rewarding him. He puts new clothes on him and new shoes on him. This represents the righteousness that when we come back to Jesus, he puts on righteousness on us. And then a ring was placed on his finger. 
The ring has the signet or the family crest on it. It means I'm a member of this family and I carry the authority of this family. And so it restored him to everything that he had lost before, the authority that he had, the, the, the right standing, the place that he had, it's all restored. That's the story of the prodigal son. And if you remember that the, the other brother was jealous, you would say, that, that, that this son is getting a party thrown for him when he had stayed and been faithful the whole time. And there, there are, there's some valid comparisons to draw with the Gentiles and the Jewish people that, that maybe as the Gentiles come to the, the Father or to Jesus, that the, the Jewish people say, but we've been here, we've been your family all along. There's some good comparisons to make there. Primarily, uh, though, comparisons of grace, the grace that, that the son experiences as he comes back. And the fact that everything is restored to him, including all of the authority that he had before. That's the story of the, the prodigal son. It was needed, necessary for that time. It, it, it makes sense. So that's the story of the prodigal son. I want to tell you a story that's really similar to it. I'm not trying to add to scripture, but I want to illustrate what it's actually like. If you've had trouble reconciling this uh, uh, vicious king that comes in with fire coming from his eyes and a sword in his hand. If we, if we want to justify that and also understand Jesus, the suffering servant who lays down his life, let me just tell you a story. It, it's my story, all right? It's not about scripture, but I, I'm basing it as a frame of reference for the, the prodigal son so that we can understand the story. So again, you have a father, he has a kingdom, a household, and he has two sons. And the younger son leaves, takes his inheritance, sells it all, lives in lavish decadence, does whatever he wants to do for as long as he wants to do it. And then eventually the money runs out and then he, he, he becomes indebted to others. The person gets into uh, uh, gambling, into uh, uh, violence with people that are not kind, people that you would owe things to in the future, gets into such a mess that he cannot get out of it. Not simply that he's living in a, a, a pigsty or something like that, but so, so trapped and ingrained in his sin and the violence and the corruption that he's been a part of, that now he owes the wrong people money. And so they're holding him captive. And the older son notices that the father is sitting on the porch every day looking for the son. And instead of becoming jealous by that or enraged by that, he gathers up a bag of stuff that he'll need and he takes off on the road and he goes looking. And when he encounters evil, it sometimes looks maybe like the movie Taken, like he is, he's a beast. He beats him up, he kills them, he does whatever it takes. He's on a mission, he's gonna find his brother and he's gonna bring him home. The violence in this example is that he is uh, powering through out of being driven by love, whatever resistance comes against him in whatever way he needs to power through it in order to get back to the person that he loves. But then finally he gets to the boss and the boss is the one holding captive the, the, the brother, the younger brother. And the boss says, the problem is that your, brother, your younger brother, he made a deal with me. And the deal was that if he lost, he would owe me his life. And there's no getting out of that deal. And so the older brother says, all right, I hear you, but why don't you take me and let him go free? The younger brother leaves there thinking I've lost my older brother. I'm grateful that he saved me. I'm grateful that he got me out of the mess that I got myself into. But I can't believe it ended in the death of my older brother. And he's walking much like maybe the sad disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, imagining what will life be like without my older brother. And then as he's approaching the house, he sees that his father and his brother are there. And somehow by the miracle of the power of the father, the son has risen again. And though he went on a mission searching for you 
doing everything that it took to get you back, fighting every battle that he ever had to fight, and then eventually paying to get you back with the price of his own life. When he welcomes you back, he puts a ring on your finger and says your authority is back. He puts new clothes and new shoes on you and says your righteousness is back. You remember what Jesus said to the disciples at the Last Supper? I'm going to my Father's house because I'm gonna prepare a place for you. I'm preparing a place for you. You're gonna be welcomed back. You're gonna be thrown a party. You're gonna be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven and you're gonna be given all authority that was lost in the fall. It's all gonna be given back to you. And that's the miracle of the work of Jesus Christ. That's what he did for us. Jesus is strong, mighty, powerful, The fear of the Lord is a real thing. Like a wild fire, forest fire flowing through land that burns up all of the dead wood on the ground, that that removes everything that is dead and, and is dying. He is a force of nature and supernature. He is everything. He is powerful. He has a sword that could remove and wipe out any person in your way, any enemy in your way. He has that type of authority, but he is also the person who is willing to put the sword back in the sheath and lay down his life. I'll tell you exactly what the definition of being like that is like. Do you remember that... uh, that Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he said this weird little saying. He says in Matthew chapter five, verse five, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. In the story of the father who owns the house, the, the sons are gonna get an inheritance. Our inheritance, you and I, our inheritance is the earth. So when we go back and we see Jesus says, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. This is actually talking about once Jesus comes again, the new heavens and the new earth, who will reign and rule on the new earth? Who will rightfully have dominion over the earth? It's us. We will continue to do that. And the word meek does not mean weak. The definition has changed. If you look in the dictionary today, it's a, a, you know, a pushover and things like this. The definition of the word meek has changed. When you go back to its biblical roots, the definition of the word meek goes something a little bit like this. One who has a sword and knows how to use it, but sheaths it instead. You have been given. You have been given authority and dominion, and God asked you to use it wisely. We as Christians have that kind of power, but who will it be that inherits the earth? It's the ones who have all the power, but know when not to use it. How we treat people around us, how we decide to use the power that Christ has given us will be our testimony, and it will be our inheritance. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me, if you will? Blessed are the meek. You, right there where you are. Whether you're sitting at home, whether you're listening, whether you're watching online at one of the campuses or at one of the gatherings, Hear the words that I'm about to speak over you. You have power and dominion. It is God-given. You did not attain it or earn it. You have power that has been given to you by God. And the question we ask ourselves today is how will we use it? Jesus knew when to dispense with enemies and he also knew when to tell the woman who was caught in adultery that there was no condemnation on her. Maybe today you're thinking about 
the corruption of America, the decadence of the world. Maybe today you're thinking about all the evil that exists and you go, God, just get me out of here. This is our home and will continue to be our home. And he has asked us to do something about it. So what will you do? I'm asking you this week to walk with your chin up and your shoulders back, a smile on your face that says, I know that I have dominion over this place. And in all of my power, what I'm gonna choose to give to people is not my wrath, but my kindness. In just a moment, we're gonna pray. And that same king who fights for you, defends you, and passionately chases after you is ready to meet with you. No matter what your need is, if it's a health need, a financial need, no matter what it is, he is ready and willing to meet with you today. So Lord, I pray that you would draw every single person in just a moment, whenever we pray, Lord, that every single person who needs prayer would come forward. Lord, don't let the enemy stop us from joining together. Where two or three are gathered together, you are in our midst. And God, I pray that this body of people would go out of here today having great power and using it in mighty and miraculous ways, never abusing it, but God, using it to further your kingdom. May your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? And I wanna invite our prayer team forward. And as Pastor Josh said, we believe where two or more are gathered that Christ is there with them. And so we want to pray with you whatever need you had. Maybe there's an area of your life where you feel like you've given up dominion and you need to come and pray with someone to take that back, whether it's a health need, financial need, please, please, please do not leave this place with that concern or need in your heart and in your mind. Come and pray with one of these leaders and leave it here at the altar so you can come forward now for whatever you need prayer for. Well, I wanna tell you about some awesome things coming up. First, I wanna remind you, as has been mentioned already, water baptisms are coming up next weekend. And if you have not experienced baptism, please, please, please come. Something amazing spiritually happens when we are water baptized. We have everything you need. We've got all the shorts, we got blow dryers, we got whatever you need, we've got it. So please come and receive water baptism. Secondly, all the ladies in the house, where you at? Where are my ladies? All right. Hey, so this Thursday, we have one of my favorite events. We have Laugh coming up this Thursday. It's so great. If you've got friends that maybe church is not their thing, this is a great thing to invite them to. We will have an awesome comedian. It's gonna be so much fun, a great night. And lastly, I wanna let you know, if you're in your 20s, we have a Gateway Young Adult Ministry. It's something I get to serve in also. Gateway Young Adults is meeting this Tuesday. It's at the King's University, which is just off South Lake Boulevard, right across from here. We meet the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. So please, if you're in your 20s, come hang out with us. We'd love to get to know you, encounter Jesus together, and build community. Well, let me bless you as you go. God, thank you so much for your amazing word today. Lord, I pray that as we go, we would know how to use our power and when to use our power. Lord, I pray this word would fall on good soil and the enemy would not be able to snatch it. May you bless us and keep us. May your face shine upon us and give us peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you.